You're listening to New Churches Podcast, a production of Send Network on newchurches.com. We discuss all things church planting. If you're looking to take your next step toward multiplication, you're in the right place. Newchurches.com provides relevant and reliable resources for church planters, church multipliers, and disciple makers. Our growing library features pastors, planters, and church leaders like Ed Stetzer, David Platt, Trillia Newbell, Christine Hoover, Dahati Lewis, Trevin Wax, and many others. Hey, welcome to another episode, uh, edition episode. We need like a tight, like a like a exciting moment of New Church's podcast history because we have the amazing Trevin Wax on, and so and whenever we have Trevin Wax on, it's like a marquee episode. We actually like like people that the downloads go way up, like people swoon. It's not true. I mean, it's just it's no all. No one's true. believing that, Ed. No, no one's true. believing that's that. That's true. But you know what? What's cool is is we get to talk today about something. You know, we we have this church planning podcast, and we talk about super practical things like you know how to how to rent a movie theater and probably episode three hundred or whatever. But uh, but today we're going to talk about someone who was an impact to both of us, not just this reminiscing, but really some of the impact that he made in and around church planning. And that's, of course, Tim Keller. We're going to talk about the legacy of Tim Keller in church planning. Let me tell you about Trevin Wax. Trevin and I have known each other for a long time. He uh, we we had we have some funny trips, some funny stories on the road that we won't share with you. But Trevin's the vice president of research and resource development at the, for the Send Network and. He teaches some for me at where I was at Wheaton, and who knows if we'll let you come teach for me at Talbot. We'll have to see how it works out because I got questions about you. Uh, General editor of the Gospel Project. So that's what's fun, that we actually launched together the Gospel Project. And Trevin, I think that the Gospel Project may be perhaps one of our greatest um, contributions to the work of Christ. Um, you've taught on mission and ministry for at Wheaton, I mentioned, and your most recent book is called The Thrill of Orthodoxy, and you got about four others that aren't as cool as that one. But um, but good job. By the way, I thought my favorite my favorite book of yours is This Is Our Time, because I use that um, I use that and I quote that in a few places. Uh, and okay, so let's jump into our conversation because you know one of the things that you know everyone sort of had their tributes. You had. A tribute. I love the you. You posted your shelf of Tim Keller books, and I retweeted that. I love that. Um, and by the way, just so people know, like Trevin is part of the Keller Center for Apologetics as well. Tell us a little bit about that, Trevin. Yeah, that's a, a center that just recently kind of got off the ground. It's a it, it's a it's a group. There's I think twenty four of us or so of uh, who have been involved in some kind of cultural apologetics work over the years and people from you know, some that are pastors, some that are scholars, um, people that, that come together to talk about how it is that we reach a post-Christian Western world. And so we had, uh, you got people from Australia, people from, uh, uh, the UK and whatnot. And we had actually, and I mean, this wasn't really public knowledge because I, I it wasn't a publicized event, but, uh, we all of the fellows met in New York City at the end of April, and uh, got to 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 spend a lot of time together talking about things, collaborating on things, and, and whatnot. And so it's this kind of group that you know not all the fellows agree on everything, or they, but they're all wanting to reach the West. They're wanting to provide resources for the church, and so they're coming together to basically everyone's there to to sharpen each other, thinking and uh, to kind of push and figure out where we can collaborate and whatnot. And we actually did, we got to spend a, 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 a an hour with Tim. It was, he was coming out of the hospital after some, some pretty intense treatments. And so it was uh, via zoom, but we had a really, really good time with him. And it was just, that was, you know, about three weeks before, before he died. So uh, it, that, that meeting itself has, you know, uh, added significance, I think to, to those of us that were there, but yeah. Um, yeah, but that, it's just that, what's interesting, Ed, is that's just one element of Tim Keller's ministry. There's so yeah. there, we, we can talk about him about. as author, pastor. Yeah. We could talk about him as apologist. Yeah. But I know we want to focus on church planting, but that it's just there's so many different ways in which Tim influenced evangelicalism. Well, in the, and that's, in the, in that's the world. why I think it's fascinating. So when we were, um, I did, and we'll put we'll put the show notes if people want to listen to this. I did a radio show with Colin Hansen. 
um, the I guess it was the day after he died. Yeah, he died Friday morning, and my radio show was live Saturday morning. And of course, we'll link to your. And for those who are listening, you can go to the show notes and you can find the link to Trevin's article. Uh, we'll link the church leaders article that 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 we did, and uh, and my radio show with Colin Hansen. But one of the things, like so, Colin is he. You know, of course, in my in his mind, I mean, he he recognizes that 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 Tim's all his other things. But you know, I mean, he his book covers the, the broad field. But, you know, I mean, Collins Gospel Coalition, that's where you're connected, the Gospel Coalition. So there's like a whole world of Tim Keller co-founding the Gospel Coalition. And, you know, I'm not engaged or involved in the Gospel Coalition. Um, but so my whole world related to Tim Keller was around church planning and missiology. And you could like, you could like spend like a whole lot of time in that world and not know of Tim's, uh, you know, really enthusiastic uh, engagement of uh, C.S. Lewis. You know, or Tolkien, you know, and so all all these things. So again, multifaceted individual. But when it comes to church planning, I mean, I think probably my first interaction with Tim was at the Dwell Conference, which was six maybe, and it was a church planning conference in New York City. And uh, and Tim and Tim, it was so funny because Tim and I sort of sat in the back right. It was at this old, it was this church that now was kind of renovated into a, into a hall, which was, you know, just now rented for, for meeting space and just sitting back with him, uh, kibitzing with him about church planting between the speakers. It was fascinating. And his awareness of church planting was, was quite remarkable. So we, and then later invited me to speak and I did this thing. I think it was called the Redeemer Church Planning Alliance at the time. It's not called that anymore. But, but so, so in, you know, and less so, you know, he didn't write on church planning in a book form, but he, um, but he engaged in it. And my favorite Tim Keller story, you know, I would ask him to do stuff all the time, like endorse my book. And he would, he, he, endorse, he did endorse a book and it was a very, it was a very wonderful day when he did, but he often said no. I mean, it was always, and he was like, he's like a, I mean, he's, what's funny. He's not a New Yorker, but he's got that New Yorker. No, I really can't. Okay. Boom. That's it. But he was I getting did, multiple requests a day at one point. I mean, at, at one yeah. point that was his excuse for me, yeah. which, you know, <laughs> And like, he, and you really like love Keller Center, and he turns you, you down really sometimes. Love, well, no, but I mean, he did. He did join me on my podcast on reconstructing faith. The last episode that we recorded, uh, he was That's there cool. for that. So, I mean, he did. He did. He was very generous with his time. And and, and the, okay, and but I, I got to tell you my funny to, story. Let me finish my funny story. Okay, okay sorry, sorry. So, so I get probably nine out of ten times I get a no. And probably you know you probably do better, but nine out of ten times I get a no. But you know, one time I endorsed uh, I think my church planning book and I was like, wow. So I email him one time, like this rando email to like it's just cut and paste. And it's clearly cut and paste. Dear sir, uh, dear you know ma'am, we are working on a church planting research project and we're looking for 30 church planting experts. So just some r- panel. So it's a random panel. We would like for you to take the time to articulate what do you think makes effective church planning so then we can subsequently test those, see if we can find statistically significant patterns to create a web-based tool for assessing church planners. And I get this email back. Like I didn't, I don't even know who we sent it to. It was just, I put him and he's like, oh, I would love to do that. And he spends all this time like going through looking at and engaging me around what is uh, what is or is not uh, the kind of attributes for effective church planning. So it just reminded me, you know, it's so much, and I, I think everyone, you know, wants to make a significant person in their own lane, but Tim loved church planting and he loved church planters. You know, Ed, when you think about Tim's impact in New York City and you think about Redeemer, the church planting network that he, Redeemer City to City, you think about the the church planting uh, network that he was part of, I'm curious what stands out to you. I, I, I mean, a couple of things that just immediately leap off the, the 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 page when I'm thinking about if I were writing, what are some of the unique elements of contribution of Tim to church planting? W- one of them would be the focus on cities, and he's not the only one doing this, of, of course. But he he helped, I think, shift the conversations in evangelicalism toward urban areas and seeing cultural influence radiate out from cities. That's not to say that he was ever dismissive of rural ministry. He cut his teeth in Hopewell, Virginia. So like he was, he was, uh, he was all about church planting in those areas as well, but he believed that evangelicals needed to give uh, a, a bigger proportion of attention to, to cities than they had in the past. So that's one thing that jumps off the page. And the other is that 
Tim knew if you're going to really reach some of these cities like New York, you you can't only think in one denominational lane. That yep. One of the things that stands out about City to City is he was willing to partner with and to help collaborate with churches who were not confessionally Presbyterian right. as long as they were preaching the gospel and they were reaching people because he knew it's it's sort of a, you know, we've, we've all got to, 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 to go shoulder to shoulder here. So, I mean, that's a couple of things that stick out to me, but I'm wondering of those, you know, what other elements of church planting stick out to you that that, yeah. that Tim made and a Let me mention too that one of the things you could see that this approach, which then became like the city to city approach, you know, I was just in uh, Australia and hung out with some of the city to city Australia leadership. And this is sort of their approach um, where uh, primary issues were always clear. You have to have a clarity on the gospel, um, you know, like, like that evangelical cooperation. Um, secondary issues, which are important issues, uh, like like baptism, like um, like our views of you know of, of men and women in leadership, um, like our views of the Holy Spirit. Those those are those are what I, I, I call them. You know, when I when I talk about you know convictional, you know, those are convictional issues. Those are those are not essential issues, but they're important issues. They're convict. These are my convictions, and um, and then of course there's there's you know just preferential issues, but. One the time I was there, like back in the day when it was Redeemer Church Planning Alliance or something like that, you could see it in the day. So in the morning, they had me spend time with confessionally Presbyterian church planters who were at Redeemer that were going out. And it was great, it was a great group, great group. Um, PCA, I think all PCA, maybe somebody, maybe a near PCA person like an Anglican church in North America. And then the second one was sort of like their their friends. They were they were mostly reformed. I don't know if they were. Um, I don't I don't know where all the issues were, but it was a broader group, and that was like lunch, and then uh, maybe it was afternoon. It was years ago, and then evening was like everybody who kind of agreed on the need for women and men to trust and follow Jesus. You'd be born again. So it was. Um, there was uh, Pentecostals, men and women, there were Presbyterians, there were, and, and, and you could see it in the day. And I think that was representative because I remember, I remember it was interesting at that Dwell conference that uh, we both spoke at, somebody asked a question to me during the Q and A about cooperation. They said, you know, could you work with Tim Keller to plant churches? And I, I did point out that I'm literally at a conference speaking with Tim Keller about planting churches, but but I also said that it doesn't work at the local level. So I think ultimately the phrase I use is, you know, you got to plant your own garden when it comes to church planting. Because I said, so Tim and I could plant a church together, which will work fine until the first baptism. And then we don't know if we need a cup or a tub. <laughs> right. um, and so, right. so he really modeled, though, pushing what, 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 what I call evangelical ecumenism. It wasn't broad ecumenism. But it was evangelical ecumenism, working with fellow evangelicals from Pentecostals to Baptists to Lutherans to non-denominational. And I think that was a wonderful, important thing. But you also mentioned, worth coming back to, is you just briefly mentioned contextualization. So he modeled contextualization in a way that was pretty fascinating. Again, because I'm a, I'm a New Yorker, right? I literally ask me where I'm from. I say New York. I'm from that city. Uh, my family took me home to a, to a home in Floral Park, Queens, across the street from the train station. And uh, what Tim reminds, reminded me all the time was that New York City doesn't exist anymore. The Irish Catholic working class New York City, that right. my grandfather was a fire battalion chief, my uncle a New York City cop, my dad a union iron worker. So, so as that sort of went away, this New York that he talked about, and he would use this phrase because he, he would talk about it. He was never like dismissive of someone else, but there was this church plant in New York City that had done really well, it grew to a thousand people. Um, and I'm trying to remember if I spoke at or a visitor or whatever. And I was talking about it. He says, oh, it's great. I'm thankful they're here. Our target's different. I said, well, tell me about your target. He says, our target is, um, is rooted New Yorkers. I don't know if he said target, but we're reaching rooted New Yorkers. And if you go to his church, which, which I did, I brought my daughters to the church when it met at Hunter College, which was pretty weird because I later would inter- be the interim pastor of Calvary that met in Hunter College. So we met where in 2007, I attended church, brought my, my daughters my daughters thought it was boring and like a lecture and because the the band was you know four guys with wind instruments doing some sort of performance that was super for New York City but my <laughs> right. kids grew up in you know rock and roll four chord chorus worship and but that was rooted New York so all the cool hipster pastors and there and there are many and I'm not mad at them by when I say that but all the cool hipster pastors who sort of had this man crush on Tim Keller would often be surprised when they went to the church that contextualization in New York City 
doesn't look like a cool hip band in you know in in a gentrified community in Atlanta and I think that was he he taught about contextualization his lectures at Covenant Seminary on contextualization I was just referring to in the book I'm writing on the future of evangelicalism because he reminds us that everybody is syncretized to some level and that was a really important thing like nobody's not syncretized we're all living in this cultural thing but his contextualization mattered more about where he was than what other people thought about uh, what he was. And and I think, too, that's I want you to weigh in because you're at this Color Center for Apologetics that also kind of led to his cultural engagement views really informed his approach to evangelism and apologetics, which are deeply connected to church planning, but not quite the same thing. So, so I mean, what's the Keller way on some of these things? You know, the, I don't think that there is a particular he would, Keller way. He would way. be mortified but, if I if he heard us ask say yeah, Keller way. Well, yeah. he well he would. I, so I the, one of the things that I I, I did an article last year because there was you know a lot of in the last couple of years of Tim's life, Tim became controversial in some circles, it's which so is really interesting. Yeah. yeah, it is because he's you know so ironic as a, but his 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 um, uh, he, the the way that he was engaging became itself controversial for some that didn't believe he was vocal enough in particular political issues or, uh, uh, you know, that he had front, he, he was so front facing in his evangelistic outreach that a lot of some people thought that, uh, this was actually not the best approach in a, uh, a more secular post-Christian environment. So, uh, which, which is interesting because Keller was sort of ahead of the curve and actually seeing people come to faith in a more, post-Christian secular environment than what has become for the rest of the country or for much of the rest of the country. Totally. Um, so, but, but I did, I did an article last year called contextualizing Tim Keller in which I was basically one of the things that stuck out to I, me. I didn't read that the, article. Where do you, do you like have a blog or something? Yeah. Thanks, Ed. Thanks. <laughs> I, <laughs> Sorry, I, people I, don't I, know, like we've been friends a long time. So this a is lot, kind of a lot of people don't read everything that I, that I write. I'm still I, trying I to get my wife to read my book. All good. So, yeah. Okay. Tell us about contextualizing uh, Tim Keller. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the thing, one of the things that stands out to me was, uh, this was, we, I, I was in New York city with some, some friends. We met, we spent an afternoon with Tim. Uh, this was the, before the pandemic. So this was right before he was diagnosed with, with cancer. Um, uh, and we were talking about preaching. We were talking about teaching. We were talking about ministry in the city and, and what, what, what the needs were. And Tim had like this long list of what well, we need this group doing this. We need these people doing that. And, and his concern was that everybody had their own medicine that they were in love with and were like, we're, we're constantly belittling other people's medicines for an ailing church and for an ailing culture. Right. Um, uh, but one of the things he said was, uh, we were talking about his sermons and preaching and whatnot. And he said he would not recommend that a church planter to the city kind of take his way of preaching, um, and replicate it. And I think some of some of us in the room were a little surprised because I think we felt like, wait, you're you're saying don't imitate you. And Keller's saying, no, the way I was preaching in the, you know, in the in the nineties in New York City and early two thousand, like the culture is is different already. Like there are different emphases. There are different things that need to be brought out. There need, that 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 contextualization needs to take place, of uh, even in preaching. So Tim was one of the first people who would say. Uh, if you're going to learn contextualization, you really have to be an exegete of the culture and an exegete of the scriptures so that you can bring the scriptures into what, you know, Leslie Newbigin would call that missionary encounter yeah. with, with the culture. And so, so Tim was not, was, was really not, and this is one of the things that comes out in, you, you, you know, you're, you're right. He didn't write on church planting specifically, but if you read Center Church, yeah, right, exactly. his, his kind of his big textbook on, sure. you know, pastoral ministry, theological vision for ministry, all of that stuff, you, you get a lot of church planting in there. Uh, what, what's fascinating about that is he, is he is not saying there is only one particular approach. Here's church in a box, go do this. Um, he, he doesn't follow sort of the programmatic, you know, uh, ways of doing church planting that, that, you know, pop up from time to time, or you have different streams that want to do it. Instead, he says, here are the different strengths and weaknesses of these models. You want to be as close to the center as possible so that you can glean from everybody that's around you. So if, you're, if your posture is more this way, if the season that you're in in your culture is more winter rather than summer, I mean, he has all of these different ways of thinking through it. And, and what I love about Tim, and I think one of the things that, that comes out in his work that gives it applied really well to church planting, is that he didn't just tell you what to do. He taught you how to think like a missionary. And I think 
I think that's one of the areas of his legacy. And if we're going to contextualize him and kind of build on his work in the future, we're going to have to continue to do that, not just imitate and replicate what Tim did, but, but take those aspects of, 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 essential Christianity, and then bring them into a missionary encounter with a culture that is comprehensible, understandable, and, and, and to where, as Tim would say, you know, you, you want to present Christianity in such a way that people that aren't believers want it to be true. And I think that's, that comes out in his preaching. It comes out in his theological vision for ministry as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we kind of run out of time, but, but I, I think one of the things too, I just want to kind of close with this is, um, Tim reminded us of over and over again of contextualization, really focused on engaging the culture well. Um, but, but I would also say in the midst of that is that when, when we were together last time in New York city, um, uh, I was, it was the church planning leadership fellowship and I, I, I brought him over and he, we talked about evangelism and we talked about how, what he said was he thought evangelism was at an historic low. He's never been at a time when evangelism has been less important to the church in his lifetime. And, and that was deeply grievous to him. And I, and I remember while I was there, I got a phone call from um, a, a producer at a major news outlet. You, you would know the news outlet, but I won't share her name just for the sake of, of uh, privacy. So she calls me up and she says, uh, you know, we want you to come on this, this, this news outlet. So one of the top five uh, live for an interview. Uh, I think they were having a conversation about whether she was, she was checking me out first just to make sure that I would be a good interview. And, and I said, well, you know, I'm in, I'm in this meeting, I'm in New York city and, uh, I got a, I'm, I'm here and hosting a friend and we're talking about church planning and, um, I might have to go back in. And she asks me, so who's the pastor? And I said, well, his, his name's Tim Keller. And she said to me, you know, I, and, and she, she'd already written a book. She was a well-known author. She said, I was on a spiritual journey and, um, this would have been four or five years ago now, but she just said, and two years ago, she was actually in, uh, in another part of the world on a spiritual quest, not Christian. She said, and some friend gave me a Tim Keller book, Reason for God. And, uh, and I read that and, and, and I'm, I'm now a follower of Christ in this major secular, you know, uh, environment. And I, and I, and I thought to myself, Tim Keller reminds us that, um, that the world we're heading towards where one to 2% less of Americans or people are in the English speaking Western world, one to 2% less identify as a Christian every year. We're becoming a more and more secular environment. And what we have to acknowledge is that the people we're going to be reaching are far more like her than I just mentioned, than they are like the people maybe that I first reached, you know, 30 years ago when I planted my first church with a mailer that said, are you tired of boring church? You know, cause, cause here's the thing. Uh, she wasn't tired of boring church. It wasn't even on her radar screen, anything about religion or faith. Tim Keller's church planning was driven by evangelizing secular people. That's the future. That's what we got to learn. I apologize. I didn't, I didn't actually hear you, but what were you saying? No, I was just saying, she didn't know enough about church to be bored by it. And that yeah. is, that's actually more of the future than we realize yep. as we're seeking to follow in Tim's footsteps and reach people. Tim Keller, uh, fascinating conversation. I, I, I said it was like a you know, your spiritual father for many, uh, and looked to him as a as a as a spiritual father to learn and to grow. And he will be missed. And uh, I hope that his legacy includes and does provoking, as the writer Peeper says, provoking one another, loving good deeds, including in areas of church planning, contextualization, and more. Thanks for listening to this episode of the New Churches Podcast. You've been listening to the New Churches Podcast, brought to you by Send Network. If you like what you heard, take a few minutes to rate and review us or share this episode with a friend. It's the best way to show your support. To find more reliable resources to start your new church well, visit newchurches.com.